hello. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar called Catastrophe, a 50-year retrospective of the catastrophic events and the lessons engineers can learn. Uh, this webinar will begin with a presentation followed by a 10 to 15 minutes uh, for a Q&A session. Uh, so if you could use the question box to ask your questions and we will try to get through as many as we can. Uh, my name is Jack Tretiwi and I am an outreach coordinator for the IMECI Yorkshire Humber Processes Division. And our speaker today is Richard Roth. He is a fellow of the IMECI and works for Costain as a group process safety manager. Uh, furthermore, Richard is a graduate of the University of Manchester and a chartered mechanical engineer. But I shall pass you all over to him now to let him introduce himself further. Morning, everybody. Um, hope you're doing well and uh, welcome. Um, yeah, so uh, my experience is uh, around about 20 years in the chemical industry, followed by about five years in steelmaking and uh, now getting on for eight years in uh, engineering and construction. Um, before I kind of go into what Costain does, I just wanted to give a shout out for a, a couple of things I do outside of work. Uh, I'm chair of the UK Process Safety Management Competence Program Board, which is a bit of a mouthful, but, but that program board looks after a suite of training that's aimed at, at improving competence for UK uh, practitioners that need process safety management understanding. And, and we have a program of uh, training that, that's aimed at both leaders, managers, technical staff and operators. Um, uh, and a further shout out for the Hazards Forum. Uh, Hazards Forum is an interdisciplinary learning organization that, that was started by the institutions, the primary engineering institutions in the UK, um, in order to prevent and mitigate hazards and disasters. Um, I've recently been asked to join the Technical Advisory Committee for the Hazards Forum, but if you're not familiar with it, um, certainly check out uh, both uh, the UK PSM program and, uh, and the Hazards Forum. Um, so just in terms of Costain uh, and uh, where I work now, you know, what's the day job? Um, so I'm head of process safety for the whole business. Um, we're largely uh, a UK business, but really this slide is, is here to demonstrate the sort of nature of the kind of organizations that we work with. Um, we're trying to um, meet UK infrastructure needs, uh, but, but we, uh, we work across a number of sectors and it's given me an opportunity to get involved with some things that I had not been familiar with before, but also to see the different types of hazards, the different types of risks uh, across industries that um, include energy, water, transportation and defence. So all sorts of organisations, all sorts of scales. Okay, so today's event, um, I want to talk through a number of things. Uh, I want to talk initially about what, what do I mean by a catastrophe. Um, it's worth understanding at least my definition, my working definition for this session. I've, I've got to uh, uh, take a very quick canter through 50 years um, in terms of an overview of, of some incidents. So I, I'm going to talk about just how many there have been but also to uh, expand on a small number of those. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to have time to forensically dissect uh, any of them because there are so many, uh, but what I do want to do is draw out some messages and some general learning. <clears throat> Following that, I, I want to talk about the challenge of learning lessons uh, and, and what what is the challenge of learning lessons and perhaps give some challenges to professional engineers. That's not those of us on the call, but for professionals of all flavors, in fact, um, and and also to, to organizations. Um, and then obviously my day job is process safety, so I, I can't leave without talking very briefly about process safety management, although I'm not going to extensively dissect that subject. Okay, so what do I mean by, uh, by a catastrophe uh, for this presentation? So I'm talking about relatively short-term events or, or occurrences where there are serious outcomes, uh, and by which I mean you know, multiple, many even, um, but serious injuries or fatalities. Uh, I'm talking about widespread environmental impact in some cases, 
public disruption, certainly, and, and potentially widespread public concern, even in the absence of the other items. So I'm also talking about uh, events that are precipitated by or involve failures of man-made systems and artifacts. So I, I, I'm not talking about uh, genuinely natural disasters, but we would include things where uh, natural disasters have then led on to failures of man-made systems. So just gave me a, a sort of limitation as to what I should include and what I should not include. <coughs> Okay, so um, you may well not be able to read the text on this, depending on the scale of the screen you're looking at it on. And I think that's really my point. Um, this, uh, this list was created from a pretty short straw poll of a couple of colleagues and friends and family members over what could we remember the names of incidents or the, or the locations of incidents in the last 50 years. Um, Obviously, at the early end of the 50 years, I wasn't paying attention to this stuff, um, but um, others were. And one or two of these, you might argue, were just outside my 50-year time window. But I guess my point here is this is a seriously incomplete list of things that would count as a catastrophe in the last 50 years. And, and I, I'm based in the UK, and therefore, there's a preponderance of UK and European events in here because those are the ones that occurred to my mind. Um, there are most certainly others around the world in this list and that will be in the list in your head. So uh, one of my former colleagues made a point uh, on LinkedIn the other day that, you know, sadly, the list is long and sadly, it, it doesn't end. It keeps happening. And I guess we can reflect on that when we start to get to the point uh, where I talk about the challenges of learning lessons. So I'm going to pick a number of these, uh, and actually one or two that, that don't show up on this list, uh, and I'm going to try and give you a bit of a flavour for what happened. Um, I'm going to range across sectors, uh, and some sectors that I haven't worked in, but have found out information uh, about the events or, or was told information about the events. Um, so really, I, I want to kind of dissect each event slightly and then give some general lessons and hopefully that makes some sense to you. So I'm going to start in the 70s, um, Tenerife air disaster. Uh, the basics of this incident are that two Boeing 747s crashed on the runway at Tenerife uh, North Airport. It's called Los Rodeos at the time, but it's now called Tenerife North Airport. Um, uh, it, this remains the most deadly single uh, aviation incident, <clears throat> largely because it was two large planes that crashed and, and very many of the people on both of those planes died as a result. Um, background to what happened in this event was, uh, was that uh, a KLM aircraft started its takeoff run uh, whilst a, a Pan Am aircraft was still taxiing in the opposite direction down the runway. Um, why was taxiing required on the runway? Well, uh, there had been a terrorist incident at the normal airport for um, Las Palmas, and a lot of planes had been diverted to Tenerife. And therefore, basically, the airport was full and highly congested, and the apron was highly congested. So to get planes up, to the end of the runway to start their takeoff runs. They had to go along the runway, back off the runway onto the taxiway where it was free and, and around. And in fact, the KLM had, had taxied all the way along the runway and done a U-turn at the end waiting. So, okay, that puts us in a place where there is potential for two planes to be on the runway at the same time doing two different things. Um, there was uh, very foggy conditions uh, at the time that foggy or cloudy, depending on how high you are uh, um, in this part of the world. But basically, uh, visibility was poor and didn't have, at that time, in place technology to locate aircraft on the airfield. So it wasn't clear to the tower, other than visually, where any aircraft was or through any other communication channel. Um, another feature of this event was that the radio communications uh, technology at the time uh, meant that uh, if a third party 
cut into uh, a conversation, then it, it tended to cut out what was being said and heard by those involved. And some very critical messages were missed uh, by some of the players, some of the actors involved because of this problem. So um, a message that takeoff clearance hadn't been given was cut short by uh, radio interference in essence. On top of that, there were some non-standard communications uh, and, and therefore misunderstandings occurred as a result of that. Now, I've not worked in aviation, um, and but have flown and kind of understand the, the basics of, of what goes on. And, and the aviation industry has learned a great deal from this event, and particularly with respect to technology and communication protocols and so on. Um, but what should we learn if uh, if we don't work in aviation? Um, I thought about that and I thought, okay, what are the gener generic lessons that, that we might think about? So some communications are, are very obviously safety critical and, and that will be the case in many industries and many sectors and many situations. So if you've got safety critical communications, you need to have the right equipment to allow them to happen. Um, protocols really ought to be in place to ensure clarity um, and so you know sometimes that might be seen as jargon but the protocols things like readbacks and confirmations and use of particular terminology only uh, are quite important because then everybody's clear what has and hasn't been said but also it's important that time is allowed and um, if one were to go and search for guidance on shift handovers or team to team handovers, for example, from the HSC, sure enough, these items show up in, in their guidance as to what will make a good handover. The other message that I think I want to draw from this event is, is one about degraded modes of working. And what do I mean by that? So in this context, the need to taxi on the runway is a degraded mode of working. It's an, a non-usual way and, and, and perhaps expected uh, in the sense that it's conceivable, but not expected in the sense that it, uh, it doesn't happen every day. Now, if things are conceivable, if degraded modes of working are conceivable, then um, it's, it's kind of important that we plan for these. And it doesn't mean necessarily plan at the most detail level, but if we can conceive of them, we should be able to say, okay, what will we do in that instance? And the other feature of that then is if we're going to move to a degraded mode of working, then they need, we need a call. Somebody says, right, we're now in degraded working, so protocol for degraded working applies. Um, it would be best also to authorize that uh, at, at a particular level or have the right person or right persons or right team to authorize that. Just moving into it accidentally is also not good. So degraded modes of working is the second uh, lesson I would draw from Tenerife. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm shifting decades, but very significantly shifting sectors. Um, I'm going to talk now about the Hyatt Regency, Kansas City, uh, and there was a collapse of uh, walkway, uh, walkway within the atrium of the building. I'm just going to check if the next slide brings up the photograph. Yes, it does. That's great. Um, so. Suspended walkway across a hotel atrium collapsed during a gala event. So there were hundreds of people at this event, both on the walkway and under the walkway, and, and 114 were killed in this event. So, um, so what we see on the left in the photograph is the aftermath. The, the image on the right is a sketch of, uh, of where the walkways would have been in that left-hand photograph. So the, the pink and the blue walkways. Uh, are the ones that collapsed uh, and first the pink walkway. The important points to note about this event though are, are the sort of causation that has a number of facets as usual with, with significant events but, but important ones are that that design was changed so the design of how these walkways were suspended were changed by the constructor during construction and Ultimately, the structure was just not capable of carrying the load. Um, it was not capable of carrying the load, particularly after this change, but it may not have been capable of carrying um, full code, code requirement loads before that. 
So if I go on to how that design change worked, um, the first image shows what was intended by the designer. Um, so what we're kind of looking at is a small part of the fourth floor uh, and the drop rod holds the fourth floor up with a nut and a washer and then continues with the same rod down to the second floor. Um, part of the difficulty with that design is to insert the fourth floor, you kind of have to put it in at the second floor level and, and draw it up somehow. And the constructor thought ah, there's a, got to be an easier way. Uh, and so the constructor modified the design. Now, they did make a call to the designers, but, but it, ultimately this design change wasn't formalized by a full check and authorize and, and repeat of the calculations and so on. So what we see in the right-hand image now is that the nut and washer on the bottom has now got the load of two floors on it. So it, it's got the floor that we can see in the sketch here, but suspended from that is also the floor below. Uh, and ultimately that led to uh, overload uh, of that part of, uh, that part of the structure. Um, it's kind of important to note that uh, this box section was also created by welding channel sections together. So there is to some extent an inherent weakness along the seam line, um, but ultimately it could have been uh, designed and built and fabricated in that way if, if the loads had been properly understood. We can see the failure mode of the connection in these photographs. Um, but if, if you're not involved in civil engineering or building or structures, that might not be an event that, uh, that you'd think about when you think about catastrophes, but, but yes, they can happen in, in, in other sectors. So in thinking about the, the gene generic lessons I would draw from, from Kansas City, um, yeah, communicating the design intent is probably safety critical or environment critical, I, I would say definitely, but you know, in, in, in most instances, we've got to get over what was intended from those that intended it to those that have to deliver it and potentially those that use it later. Um, so if we make changes during construction, and this does happen really quite a lot, um, then that's a design process that needs to be managed. And certainly as far as UK regulations are concerned, I know there may be people from outside of the UK, there's, there's a regulation called CDM around construction, but it very clearly defines design as, as anybody telling anybody to do anything, whether that's verbally or in writing or by a drawing and so on. So it's kind of important to note that if we don't build it as we said we're building it, then we are now a designer. Uh, and that's worth reflecting for engineers who, who might be in the field solving problems. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do that, but it does mean that we should reflect on, on the requirements of that task. Uh, the final piece here for me is that, that constructability does need to be properly considered. Um, you know, how can this be built? Can it be built safely? Uh, are definitely some questions that uh, we probably do better at now uh, than we used to, but I, I still do see problems of, of, of things that you think, well, how the heck is that actually going to be created? Okay, my next event uh, further into the 80s is uh, is actually an event that anybody who works in the water sector may have heard of. Um, in essence, this was a methane explosion, but it occurred at a water pumping valve station. Um, in Lancashire in the UK. Um, methane from mining was forced through the duct by water pumping, uh, found its way to uh, an ignition source in an enclosed facility. At the same time, a uh, public visit was taking place. So not only do we have uh, an event of uh, uh, an explosion, but we have an explosion that involves the public. So hence, it, it rather meets my terms of a catastrophe. Um, the image at the bottom that you can see is, uh, is a kind of concrete structure. Uh, and as with many explosions and building situations, it, it's the structure falling on the people that, that did quite a lot of the harm in terms of uh, causing fatal injuries and uh, non-fatal injuries. So, so the structural collapse 
resulted from the explosion, but was also part of the picture. Um, mining methane had managed to get into the line. It was recognized to some extent that, that mining methane was a possibility here. And I know on this slide that the, the designers found solely liable, but only because I think that's kind of unusual. Um, often, I think with catastrophes of this sort of nature, then I would expect operational organizations perhaps also to be involved in, in thinking about such risks. Um, so, uh, you know, you might think I'm at a water facility, what chances there is of an explosion, but um, it may well be that, that had we properly recognized that, um, then there might have been a design to manage that. So to that end, my general lessons are um, actually diverse experience in your design studies um, helped to identify all, all the potential hazards. And OK, a number of you will be familiar with HAZOP and various hazard studies one to six if you're uh, in the sort of process engineering world, um, hazards of construction, various types of sit down in advance, think about it with a few people around the table. And they're great. Those, those studies are good. Uh, they can occasionally be, uh, you know, a little difficult to wind handle and get through. Uh, occasionally they're treated uh, a little bit too much as a deliverable. For me, getting the right people around the table is important. So I'll, I'll kind of come back to stuff that one might measure a, a about this later. But if, if we've invited diverse experience to our design study and it doesn't all turn up for one reason or another, you know, people can't make it, don't make it, um, then at what point does that study not, be, not remain valid? Uh, at the very least, you know, missing an expert on, you know, geology in this instance might well have been a weak signal to have we got all of the hazards identified. Um, so whilst that's not necessarily directly causal in this instance, my point is really that design studies are there for a purpose and not, not just to be delivered and diverse experience is extremely important. So the other feature here I think that's important to me was about unusual modes of operation. So a little bit like Tenerife, um, perhaps one might say, yeah, pumping at full bore is not an unusual mode of operation. I, absolutely, I, I would accept that. But if in fact, most of the time, it's slack water in this pipeline and only very occasionally do we pump at full bore, we might recognize that there's the possibility of gas being brought through with that. So we could do a number of things. We could uh, design the plant on the receiving end to deal with methane um, or, and or uh, we could make sure that people aren't around should that instance happen. So my experience in the chemical industry, uh, you know, we, we learned the hard way in that industry that we really do have to clear people out of the way when we're doing startups and shutdowns from large scale turnarounds. So, so actually reducing the consequence, if you like, by removing the people at a time when you might expect uh, things to not go as well as they might um, is a, a valid way of managing risk. And the final point here really is, is one of a kind of tension between non-equivalent risks. And, and I see this more so now, <clears throat> now that I've got some experience in sort of construction and engineering sectors. Um, you know, in this instance, the facility was buried. Uh, it, it was enclosed um, from an aesthetic perspective. Now, obviously, aesthetics are then traded off against an enclosed area, which uh, doesn't, unlike an open structure, have... Uh, any kind of ventilation for a hazardous material like methane. So that doesn't mean that, the, that we can always trade off in one direction or another, but beware the trade-offs between thing, risks that I would regard as non-equivalent and, and accept that, that we may have to understand what we've done. Okay, so uh, my next one is uh, perhaps much more familiar to many, uh, but hopefully there are one or two uh, um, more junior engineers on the call who weren't born at this point. Um, suffice it to say, though, uh, Chernobyl is, a, is one of only two 
events that, that have reached uh, the INS-7 level, which is the International Nuclear Event Scale. So, um, therefore, very serious, um, clearly very serious. Now, I've noted that there are 31 short-term deaths, but there may, there may well be many thousands of deaths as a result of um, working in, in, in what was called uh, liquidator roles. That's the people who made efforts to remediate this, uh, this facility afterwards. But even at the time, there were international effects and there are long-term effects as a result of this event. Um, so rather than me go into the details of Chernobyl, some of the bits I picked out here are that um, we were experimenting, uh, uh, or sorry, testing the facility to, to, to try, and, uh, try and make it uh, do what was expected. Tests had been done several times and, and not succeeded over the preceding years. But actually, the, the design of that testing was had come from quite an electrical systems perspective, uh, and and perhaps hadn't included how the reactor element would uh, would respond. Safety systems were disabled for the test. Um, the grid system uh, in Ukraine was such that they had to delay the test at relatively short notice, and ultimately they complete they commenced the test outside of the specified conditions. So. Even with the limitations of the design of the test, they still started it um, beyond where they should have. So what do we think about from this in, in general terms? Um, tests and experiments on operating facilities need to be thought through. Uh, there the, are the changes that need design planning, but in particular, how do I get back out of this? And at what points do I have go, no go decisions that, that allow me to move forward? Um, it's worth noting that uh, organizational culture can have an effect, uh, particularly on, on the ability to sort of say no or challenge or stop. Uh, and this can happen in any organization, in any place. And it's difficult to spot, but uh, take care if, if we make blind assumptions that uh, yeah, the, the folk involved with this will, will stop at the right point in time. There are a number of reasons why they might not. Um, and I guess finally, you know, if, if we're talking about emergency plans, we, we do need to consider the worst case at some level. Okay, switching sectors again uh, and decades. Um, I'll talk briefly about the uh, Estonia, which was a roll on, roll off ferry that sank in the Baltic in 94. Um, more than 850 lives were lost. Um, I realize there's been uh, various uh, speculation about this incident of late, but I'm, I'm working on the, the, the sort of formal reports uh, that, that came from this incident. The bow visor and, uh, and the ramp behind it failed at their sort of connection hinge points uh, in heavy weather. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the vessel sank relatively quickly and also it, it's its emergency response was uh, to some extent found wanting. So in terms of the design of the vessel, um, the, the visor and the ramp connection points were, were not deemed to be uh, safety critical in the design and approval process. So, so therefore, how they failed and in what conditions they failed and how anyone would know they were failing was, was limited. Uh, that's also linked then to information about failing structures, any information about failing structures, getting to the people who have to make the decision. So um, whilst the hinges did not have uh, any kind of system to describe how they, to the conning station, how they failed, then, then other locking devices did. And that was a result of uh, the issue that, that occurred in, uh, in Bruges some seven years before with the Herald of Free Enterprise. But not all the information came to one place. So the person at the conning station didn't have quite all the information all at once. Um, in, the, in the official investigation reports, crew response and, and the lack of guidance from the bridge were criticized. So there's some questions there about, about the response to an unfolding problem. So if I draw some general lessons, um, Emergency plans. If you've got a plan, uh, it's not worth anything unless you people know what it says and unless 
better still, they've drilled it and been through it and walked through it. Um, and it's particularly important in the context of, of transport because on a ferry, almost everybody hasn't been through the plan and, and, and the few that have are the crew. So the crew need to be absolutely clear as to what happens. So the same is true if you're building a facility um, and it's right next to the public domain, then we have to be clear how our people react and to help the public who, who haven't been drilled or know the plans. Um, it's a bit about situational awareness. A number of people will talk about situational awareness and whether, whether the folk involved in any particular incident knew quite what was going on. Oftentimes, I don't know everything, uh, and that's usually part of the preconditions to the event. But you know, it, situational awareness is most needed in the unusual times when something's going amiss. So have we got all the information coming to the right place so the right person or persons or team can make that call uh, and make a, uh, make a decision in a timely and uh, well-informed manner? Um, I think the final point here is that is that where failure modes are potentially catastrophic, then absolutely we need to be certain there are multiple barriers. Uh, and I know that you know, some of the comments on LinkedIn from people around the world, yes, focus on the barriers and not on the loss, absolutely is, uh, is a better way to manage such events. I will come back to that. Okay, uh, another one into the 2000s now, uh, a dust explosion at a sugar refinery in Georgia, in the US. Um, 14 killed, 36 injured. It, it, dust explosions are sadly too common and, and were common before this. Uh, you know, the, the outcome of this is not only that people were killed and injured, but the facility didn't reopen. So you, you then have employment and local economic factors as well. But some points to note here is we have a congested factory, quite outdated designs, which not only made uh, an explosion uh, more consequential, but it also meant that, that it was very difficult to get in and do emergency response and investigation because the structures were were in quite a state after it, after the event. So some lessons here. Um, I'll actually go to the bottom one first. Uh, the fire pentagon. Um, it is is important if you've got any kind of dust uh, that's combustible that you understand the fire pentagon and the people understand the fire pentagon. So uh, having a combustible dust having an oxidant, having an ignition source, but having dispersion and confinement are the two extra ones, if you like, that, that go beyond the fire triangle for, for combustibles and flammables. Um, so dispersion and confinement takes me back to the top. So if we've got lots of dust everywhere, then the opportunities for dispersion are higher. So general maintenance, sweeping up, cleaning things, looks very mundane but actually that might be a safety critical task where you've got a combustible dust in it. and indeed i might come back to that point in several other incidents um the other piece to note is that that cyclic studies of hazard and risk can think about outdated equipment and identify it um, you know, it might be that we've been operating this facility for many years but you know the reality is we should check it against modern standards on a routine basis. So certainly in the process industries, five-year cyclic process hazard analysis is a fairly common process now, but could be valid in other industries. Um, the other point, the other point about dust is things that are not hazardous can be hazardous when finely divided. You know, metal dusts can be serious in this respect. Um, lots of food products. Uh, find their way into this and so forth. So it's not just the, the chemicals and the things you might recognize, it's some stuff that might seem pretty benign. Okay, I'm going to talk about the details of Macondo well, but I, I put it in to switch sectors and switch decades again. Uh, the event, though, was a blowout from an exploration well. Uh, 11 fatalities and, and nearly 20 other injuries and extensive marine pollution. So we've got an event that not only has killed people, but caused environmental damage as well in this instance. Um, many of you will, will have studied this and know much more about it, but the basics are 
there were a failure, although there were thought to be multiple barriers to an event like this, multiple uh, lines of defense, however you want to describe them. They, there were assumptions by the people involved in those various uh, barriers that other barriers would work and, and would work at a particular reliability. And ultimately, that can cause a problem from the perspective of tolerability of risk. So to that end, one of my, my generic lessons from this is that if we come to a conclusion that a risk is tolerable because there are, say, four barriers in place, um, then it might well not be tolerable if one of those barriers fails. Now, those barriers will fail at some given rate because all barriers do, but if we know that a barrier is in a failed state, continuing without it has changed the risk position that we're operating in. So just think about if there are multiple barriers, they can't rely on each other. Now, arguably, that's a common mode failure, but they can't rely on each other from a human perspective either. Um, and the final piece here is, is that, that focus, that as many of you be aware, there was a lot of focus in, in the organizations involved in this event uh, on personal safety and, and injuries, uh, but it is important that catastrophic incident potential is, is also being thought about and talked about by senior teams. So, um, Lac Megantique in Quebec, Canada, uh, 2013, uh, a train uh, with a lot of crude oil on board uh, ran away, unattended train ran away, uh, 11 kilometers uh, down a 1.2% gradient. Eventually, it derailed in the center of Lac Megantique in the downtown area, uh, and there were 47 fatalities, so they all members of the public, uh, because there was no driver on the trains, there's not workers. Um, and just in terms of the scale of the destruction, 30 buildings immediately destroyed and all but three of the remaining 39 had to be demolished due to uh, damage and contamination. So that's essentially the whole of the centre of the town. Um, what happened here was a locomotive had been parked, uh, left unattended, which was a, a, a normal process but the locomotive has to remain uh, running to keep air onto the air brake system. Now, there were handbrakes applied, but ultimately too few. Um, the locomotive had been suffering problems during the journey, um, but seemed to have settled down. However, later uh, a fire broke out and the local fire services came and, and they did what you would expect them to do, which is to turn the local off as part of stopping fire. However, that led to the air brake system failing and ultimately with too few handbrakes, the train began to run away. Um, so what, what do we think about here? Um, human factors or, or behaviors. I think it's worth noting that, that routine and situational violations can be predicted uh, and should be predicted and hopefully designed out, but they can be predicted. And so not quite putting enough brakes on it is a relatively predictable uh, outcome if you have a train that's a mile long and, and putting enough brakes on might require you to go from one end to the other. Now you might say, well, hang on, that's the, that's the job of the driver. We need then to be certain the driver has enough time to do that. So thinking about um, routine and situational violations, we probably, we probably can spot them happening, but we can also predict them happening as well. Um, emergency response for technical systems needs technical input. So the fire services did what they their standard operating procedure says, you know, burning engine, turn engine off. Um, that makes sense to them, but in, in the absence of somebody who understood how the train worked, then the downstream effects of that were not recognized. So um, you have to be quite careful with, with technical systems that, that when we have an emergency response, we understand the effects it might have. And the final one really is about rail systems. Uh, they, they run through populous areas. So, you know, we need to think about hazardous freight. Um, and that's just the way those systems tend to have developed. Okay, so I'm going to go to mining and or um, dam management, depending on how you, how you see this. But uh, Brumaginho Dam failure in Brazil in 2019 led to nearly 300 deaths. Um, something like 
12 million tonnes of material was lost from a tailings dam and may well have led to ecosystem damage, so at ecosystem scale. At the very least, uh, the organisation involved in this, market capitalisation reduced by quite a significant sum of money. Um, points of note about this is that the way the dam had been built was, um, was questionable from a geotechnical perspective, but structural integrity sensors had, had been known to have problems. Uh, and there had been a previous dam failure within this organization and the investigation hadn't really properly been completed and closed out some four years before this. Uh, and there were certainly regulatory gaps in this case in terms of what, what the organization was required to do. The other piece to note is that uh, a lot of people were in the line of fire, if you like. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so, a tailings dam might be regarded uh, by some as a sort of temporary facility, but actually temporary facilities in some instances do need to be thought of as permanent. They're going to be there for long enough. We can't just rely on it being around for a short time to say the risk is acceptable. So think about your temporary facilities and how long they're going to be there. Um, if a risk is tolerable with with, a barrier miss, with all the barriers in place, it might not be. So that's the, the same lesson uh, as, as came from Macondo. Um, investigations can be difficult and in some cases it may be that, that there's a need for a, reg a regulatory response. So people in the line of fire, um, you know, the, the tailings when this dam burst swept through the, the offices and canteen area of, of the mine and, and hence a lot of people uh, in the way at the time. So think about where your people are. Okay, my final Incident before I move on to other areas is, is the port explosion in Beirut. Now, most of you will know at least as much as I do about this because I, I guess finer details are still limited. But the basics are a very large quantity of ammonium nitrate uh, exploded following a fire and hundreds dead, thousands injured, and, and possibly hundreds of thousands of people having to evacuate their homes and, and, and only some being able to quickly uh, return. So we have extensive damage, we have uh, a serious event. And just in terms of the photographs, um, the, the lower photograph shows a, a concrete grain silo structure that's, that's partly damaged but partly uh, still standing. And the sort of circular water area was previously a quayside. So it, that pool was not a pool before the explosion. So in the top, um, top photograph, you see a sort of circular pool in the cutaway, and that's on the second jetty from the right. Um, a very significant e event, a very significant explosion. Basics, though, I think are that, that hazardous material stored for longer than expected in a warehouse that didn't seem to have the appropriate safety measures for such a material. <clears throat> and of course, that being in a port, uh, is also a populous area. So we have people nearby hazard at the same time as hazard being stored. So the lessons I think in general are, you know, if you've got a lot of something hazardous, you really do need to apply some focus. And a number of jurisdictions around the world, UK, Europe, uh, India, US, and, and others certainly that I know of um, have have regulatory regimes that have uh, quantity-based thresholds uh, and therefore recognition that once you've got enough of this stuff, a very big uh, bank and result is, uh, is very important. The other feature here is that storage is a process. Um, those of you uh, familiar with the Bunsfield explosion in the UK in 2005 will, will recognize that the idea of storage of hazardous materials perhaps wasn't fully recognized in the UK as a process at that point, but it is. Even if you're just holding it, it's a process. So think about what you need to do to manage that. And I'm back with my point about general maintenance. So uh, electrical faults, security of the building, um, sweeping up, uh, maintenance of sprinkler systems, et cetera, et cetera, all may seem mundane, uh, but it might well be critical. So uh, again, that's a very quick counter through a number of incidents. Um, it seems that learning lessons is difficult because we seem to be starting to see the lessons repeat. Um, so uh, on that, I, 
I, was, I, I sort of set myself the challenge of saying, well, what is it that causes problems? Why, why don't we learn? Why isn't society and or, or industries or, or, or even organisations, why aren't they learning? Well, it could be time. Have we got time for all that? Um, it, it could be that it's somebody else's problem. And uh, that's a photograph of Douglas Adams. And I'll let you look him up and why there's somebody else's problem is against his name. Um, it could be that we think it's too difficult. Um, maybe it's expensive. Maybe it's expensive. Um, some of you will be familiar with uh, a guy called Trevor Kletz, who was something of a guru in the process safety world uh, from the chemical industry. And he used to say, well, um, you know, if you think safety is expensive, try having an accident. Um, so, OK, that's, that's one response to that. But it appears quite expensive at the time. It may be that there's corporate memory loss. And uh, Trevor Kletz also had a comment, uh, a quote about uh, corporate memory. You know, he said organizations don't have any memory, only people have memory. Well, I want to come back to that in a moment because I, I, I think we need to challenge that or, or to try to work around it. Other features are that people will see these events as low probability and therefore therefore low risk. But of course, probability multiplied by consequence, if you like, is risk. And that might mean the risk is on a, on a similar level to you know, my falling over, walking out of my office. In terms of that's a frequent occurrence, but much less likely to be consequential. Um, the other feature might be that wide-scale change is required. And, you know, if I change it here, I have to change it everywhere. And, oh, dear, that's, that's going to take a lot. Might amount to both too difficult and then too expensive in the same means. So, OK, well, I think about a challenge to professionals and professional engineers in particular uh, as individuals. We can kind of know just about anything. Uh, and... Yeah, I, I used Wikipedia quite a lot in, in getting some of the details of these events together once I'd had the sort of headline of the event in my head. Um, so I can find that stuff out, and you can find that stuff out, but I don't think it's good enough because I don't think um, that knowing I can find it is the same as having internalized what the lessons are. So uh, I'm not arguing that you need to remember them all, but I am arguing that on a personal level, you can be curious, that you can read around. If you're in aviation, you can read about surgery. If you're in construction, you can read about aviation. Um, if, if you're in water industry, you can think about the chemical industry and so on. So, and I say read around in quotes because, you know, it, it, watch around there are many resources now with with great videos and animations so so this is not all just about reading but be curious but also if you know a thing pass on your knowledge and i think the passing on of knowledge from one engineer to the next is how it, it gets its context um so on that front you know if if you manage people uh who are professional engineers and and should be doing this then actually make sure that, that doing those things are valued in the culture you set. Check that it's happening. You know, have, you, have you read around? Have you passed on your knowledge? Have there, is there a lunch and learn process? Is there a process by which auditors switch positions so that they can share their knowledge? Um, so I think it's possible to measure this as well. And therefore, one might see this as a leading indicator to managing catastrophic incident risks. It's, you know, is it happening? Are my people sharing? Can I can I measure that that's happening? Now, if it's not happening, then then I I would say there's potentially a weak signal that that information might not be passing as freely as you would like. The other feature, of course, is if you're senior and you're now managing, but you do know some stuff, take part in the events, do the reading around yourself, do the passing on yourself. So that's a challenge at a, at a personal level. Um, and, and, it, and I do find it's important, uh, taking Trevor Kletz's uh, quote around learning lessons, to give context. So, you know, so me saying, here's how we do it round here, because this is what the procedure says, is all very well. But if I can explain the procedure to a newcomer and say, and because this incident happened, that's what we learned, and that's why we do it that way, then that gives some context. And it's helpful for people to anchor what should go right in the context of why it should go right, what we might want to avoid. 
So an organizational approach then, in order to try and meet um, Trevor Kletz's point about organizations have no memory, is, is to try and codify the lessons. So, you know, if we need to do something in a particular way, then that's what we should say in our procedures or our guidance. Um, how should this thing be done in the future it does need to be written down. Otherwise, it, how it will get forgotten very quickly. Um, just writing it down is not enough, though. We need to communicate how it's changed and educate the people and hopefully give them some context so that they anchor it. Um, the next piece, though, is, is even that's not enough, just writing it down. We have to go check it's happening. So what is your discovery process? What's your audit or assurance process that works out whether things are happening or not? Um, use that to educate and not just to check but also make sure that the data from all of these are back in front of the senior managers KPIs because they can go, okay, I need to add more resource there or I need to change something here. And my final point is really there's a possible solution. Uh, and okay, yeah, this is my day job. I have to talk about it sometime. Process safety management is not just an approach that's valid in process industries uh, because it combines technical thinking, forward thinking, and management focus in what has to go right, however mundane that is, then it, it, it's a means to think about stopping disasters. Um, it does require competence, um, but it, it does also start with eliminating the hazard, um, and, it, and it probably could be applied where you work. So um, I've just about left 10 minutes, uh, so uh, hopefully some questions have come in uh, maybe Jack will help me out. We'll go from there. Uh, yep, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we've had a lot of uh, interesting questions come through, uh, some of them quite technical and some of them a little bit more philosophical. So okay. I will put this first question to you, um, which is uh, often processes and documentation are not recognised for their value in managing risk. So how can this uh, complacency in the workplace be addressed? Okay, so that's, that's process and documentation. Well, I, I think the point I was making in closing there is is to try and help people to see the context in which there is a process. I mean, we'll all be familiar with processes that are seriously admin heavy and you think, my word, why am I doing this? But if we give people the context as to, well, the reason we do this is to avoid this happening, and it, 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 it might help. Um, the other feature, of course, is to try and slim those processes so that they aren't admin heavy and appear to be doing things for no good reason. So, so there's two ways to approach it, make them workable, make them usable, but also give them context. Um, okay, hopefully that's a, a useful answer. Okay, I'll move on to the uh, next question, which is um, it's specific to the um, um, Tenerife. Um, so it's uh, how does degraded working in Tenerife, Tenerife uh, relate to what uh, Haddon Cave said about the normalization of deviation? Uh, okay, that's interesting. I, I mean, I, I suspect they weren't uh, they weren't operating in that mode very often at all. It might even have been the first time. But I, I think there is an interesting point about degraded working. If you do it a lot, then it's People don't see it as different somehow, and therefore there there becomes a, a, a certain level of complacency around, well, this is just normal, isn't it? Um, and, and really that was my point about calling, we are now in degraded working, it is quite an important signal to the organization that we've, we're making a temporary change and we will go back. So of course, Counting how often you're in degraded working might be a useful indicator to to the worry that it's becoming a, a thing that we're actually doing all the time. Uh, and it, it also counts to temporary changes. So temporary changes that are, are there basically permanently or get done all the time shouldn't really be managed as changes. They should be managed as the normal way of working and their risks assessed in the normal way of working and so forth. So, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and, and it's definitely a concern, although I'm not certain that in the case of Tenerife that, that was relevant, but it, it's a good question. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, another question here is quite long, so I'm going to try and uh, paraphrase it. Um, so it, um, it appears that in most workplaces, um, 
passive learning doesn't actually seem to work. And so how do you institute active learning in the workplace and um, who should be doing it? Uh, OK, so I might reverse the order of the question. Uh, everybody uh, is the answer. But uh, the the active learning element is, I think, the bit that moves us between everybody can go to Wikipedia to actually there's a routine process of passage of knowledge. Um, and, and OK, that's at an individual level. Are there lunch and learn sessions? Do people attend? Um, do people uh, prepare well, how do people share their knowledge? Um, so that I agree that passive learning is like writing down the lessons from the incident. Active learning is actually doing something different in the future. So for me, active learning does require a more organizational change. So I do have to change what the procedure and guidance or, or the rules say, and then make sure everybody knows that before I would expect them to change. And if I, if I tell you once, you might remember it or you might not. Um, if I make sure it's part of the way we do things around here, both written and, and informal, then there's a good chance it will be repeated. So I think there's a good good challenge on the difference between passive and active learning. A lot of passive learning goes on across a lot of industries. You see um, hazard bulletins and all sorts of stuff. And how many of that lands in your inbox and whether you've time to, to read it is, is a valid question. Um, but I think it's possible for organisations to give time to this uh, in a formal way. Okay. Brilliant. Hopefully Thank you. Um, so this next question is probably a bit more um, philosophical and based on the character of people, but I still think it's worth asking. Um, does the uh, fear of litigation and discovery uh, silence those who know the risk and prevent people from learning? Um, so I think that legal advice may well at times stop people being open with the details, but I think people should worry less about the details, which might be sub judice or, or subject to some future prosecution, and more about the generality. And I think the difficulty is that organizations that are currently trying to work out what went on themselves and then potentially defend a legal action um, and not want to, to kind of expose their dirty linen in public. Um, now, that said, the sort of general lessons that I tried to draw from the events I showed ought not to have made any difference to, uh, to any prosecution in any of those cases. Um, but, but actually, that may or may not be the first priority of those who are doing the immediate investigation. I do see, though, that, that prosecutions take too long, and it's certainly a message from a UK perspective. Um, they, they take too long such that finding out what happened for everyone else who's on tenterhooks does take too long. So it, it's a good challenge. I don't have an obvious answer other than perhaps industry sectors. Certain industry sectors do try to share in this way at the general level, even before events, investigations are or certainly actions after investigations are closed. Great, thank you. Um, another interesting question um, is, um, we all accept a uh, level of risk in our everyday lives. And um, at what point does uh, the risk become a risk that needs mitigation? Uh, the person posing the question then goes to say, uh, we all drive and accept that if you're in a serious car crash, we may face life uh, changing consequences. Uh, as a society, we have accepted this. Is society willing to pay for an increased level of uh, risk mitigation? Well, yeah, good philosophical question. I, uh, I, I you know, I, I suspect, um, I suspect the answer is is yes and no because you know, if it means me, of course, society should pay. Uh, but if if it means my talk, then maybe I shouldn't pay. Um, so it's it's a tricky one. Uh, I think that. Over decades, our tolerability of risks is is rightly falling. Like we, we don't tolerate risks that we used to tolerate um, 50 years ago and 100 years ago, certainly. Um, but at the same time, there comes a limit as to as to what it's worth. And and I think in general, when you describe the kind of act of driving a car, people can kind of understand what you mean by a tolerable risk. Yeah, I, I drive my car. 
some cars crash, some people crash their cars. So one day it might be me. I can see that logically. But um, I think there is a difference between the benefit I get from that, you know, personal freedom to drive around and get to where I want to be compared with the risks that are imposed upon me. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we see in, uh, you know, in, in the cost of mega projects uh, around the world, you know, that mega projects cost much more. You know, how can I.K. Brunel have built the Great Western uh, for so little? Well, OK, a lot of people died in the building of the Great Western. If we compare that to a, a modern railway project like HS2, then there's a whole lot more cost involved in managing some of the risks and not just risks to people. Uh, you know, there are environmental points uh, and uh, public disruption points as well in a, in a mega project like that. So, so I think society is prepared to pay more, uh, but you know, you, you, you can see the philosophical limit by the, uh, the amount of noise that's generated in news media. Okay, uh, very interesting. And um, I think because we're running out of time, I'll have to make this the last question. Um, so it's, uh, do you have uh, any advice regarding the assembly of a uh, diverse design team to ensure you can identify all potential risks? Um, is there a methodology uh, you can follow to ensure designers can feel comfortable that they've had a diverse input when identifying these risks? Um, uh, okay, so uh, the, the basics uh, that you might want to read are, are ICME's approach to uh, multi-stage hazard study uh, and particularly people will be familiar with the term HAZOP but actually the stages before that are quite good stages to, to get uh, diverse opinion involved so what's often called hazard study one and hazard study two sometimes um, hazard, hazard study two is called hazard identification um, so if you read up some of the guidance on that, that there are some good methodologies there about how a study is managed in terms of getting the right people around the table, there are occasionally more challenges. You know, so we say, well, how would I get somebody with construction and operational knowledge? Now, if you're building a facility for an operating organization, they ought to be able to provide people with operational knowledge. Um, however, they're often quite busy running the kit that they've got in place. So, so that can be a challenge. Similarly, Constructors may well, you know, we may well not have let a contract for construction by the time we're doing that level of design. So, so how would we do that? Well, you know, I, I think there are various organisations that, that can provide that expertise, but I, I think it is important to try to get the people who will build it, the people who will commission it, and the people who operate it, or at least some representation of that experience in, into design studies. So, um, yeah, check out. I can make as a study process and uh, and see if that works for you. If not, then actually there's no right way to do this. Um, I don't have a problem with uh, with people gathering what they think are the right people and you know even starting that meeting off with uh, have we got the right people here? Who's missing? Uh, as a question. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh, yep. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks also to everybody who has been uh, submitting their questions. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't have time to get through all of them. Uh, but just to note that um, this presentation um, as a recording will be available to you via email in the coming days. Um, I'm afraid we'll have to end it there. Again, thank you very much, Richard, for your time. Uh, yeah, thanks all. Yeah, and and particularly, uh, hello, to, hello to my former colleagues. Yeah. <laughs>